Psych with Mike library. This is another Psych with Mike. I am your host, Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here again today with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Hello, how are you? I am doing well. How are you today? I'm doing well. Trying, so, to, trying to stay healthy through the holidays. Oh, that is such a difficult thing to do sometimes. There's so many things that happen during the holidays and so many different expectations that people feel like that they have to put on themselves. And in the end, so for me, I am a big believer that we create our own distress and our own disorder. So when we feel like that there are these expectations that uh, hold an example for how we should be, then we use that information to create a a rubric and a marker for that we judge ourselves by. And when we find that we are coming up short, then we feel bad. Uh, and I think that one of the things that I always want to say to people over the holidays is, you know, don't, don't hold yourself to some preconceived idea for how you think you should be. Just be who you are. Or to some idea that you were trained by your family to believe in that doesn't reflect reality. Because your family didn't reflect reality. Uh, well, let me say it differently. I think every day of our lives, we have a conflict between our fantasy expectations and what we really are going to encounter or feel or be. That is intensified around the holidays because of messaging both from our families and from our culture about what the holidays are supposed to be like. If uh, our listeners were available for last week's discussion, we talked about people that, that have had emotional, sexual, or uh, physical trauma in, at the hands of their family of origin. And this week, and, and we talked about strategies for surviving that. And, and in that discussion, we focused on people who choose to stay healthy by not attending events that involve their family of origin uh, or participating in the dysfunctional script. To this week, We'd like to focus our conversation on people that think they are healthy enough to attend or participate without being re-damaged or additionally damaged. And that is, uh, after 35 years of, of counseling people and having this come up every single year of my practice experience, it, it's something I think is really an interesting proposition, but a very difficult one to do. And quite often my patients have thought, well, I'm ready for that. I can take that. Uh, and then the experience that they actually have is re-victimizing or damaging in some way. And they come back and they're all upset with themselves because they didn't handle it the way they wanted to. And w whenever I talk about this issue of how you're going to go to the event and be able to stay healthy yourself and not suffer some kind of re-victimization, for me, I always go back to um, the Languages of Love, and I'm blanking on the author. Uh, Gottman. John Gottman. Uh, he didn't write the Languages of Love because it was a Christian author that wrote that. But regardless. Well, he, he wrote the four love languages. Maybe they're two different things. Uh, well, in the Languages of Love, there, there are actually five. So there's gifts, um, acts of service, um, time together, physical touch and words of affirmation. And the importance of that is that when you look at those languages, it isn't as important that you understand your love language as you understand your partner's oh, okay. love language. Yeah, we had the same discussion about marriage counseling. Yeah, because that way you, you speak to your partner in the language that they understand. And, you know, I, when I talk to clients about this idea of how you're going to go to the party, to the, the family event and be able to be healthy yourself, what I always say to them is you have to think about it from the perspective of the other individual, not from your perspective. Okay. And I find that to be really helpful for people when they take themselves out of themselves and look at it. Oh, my dad's really not intentionally trying to be a jerk to me. It, it, that's just who he is. That's just how he is, even though I experience it as emotionally uncomfortable. Well, but I think there's a second and more important step to that. Once you decide your dad's not being a jerk to deliberately be mean, he just is naturally a jerk. 
then you have to decide how you're going to process right. and respond or understand that so that you don't come away rewounded. I, I have a, a friend who uh, tells me that she, she lives in another state. She has a parent, a single parent still alive here. And she speaks to this parent once every couple of weeks on the phone. And maybe once a year, twice a year, she comes to St. Louis. And every time she comes, this parent immediately is critical. Oh, mm-hmm. your hair looks like crap. Oh, you put on weight. Are you? I can't believe you're wearing those jeans on the plane. That's out of stock. Yeah. There's not, I missed you. I love you. Thank you for coming to see me. Let's have a good time together. There's one more opportunity for critical parenting. And this person knows that it's going to happen, but every time it happens, they get rewounded. Mm-hmm. They go home distraught and distressed and take up smoking again or drink or whatever they do to soothe themselves that they know is dysfunctional, Mm -hmm. eat eat food they shouldn't eat, uh, trying to nurture themselves when they've been re-damaged. But it'll come again. The annual visit is coming up. And so she's girding her loins to visit with this parent that she knows doesn't have the capacity to parent her in a loving and supportive way. So if she knows that her parent does not have the capacity right then and she accepts that she doesn't she's not saying i i need my mother to change uh, or else i'm not going to be able to tolerate it she has accepted genuinely the fact that her mother is that way then if she has actually accepted that what in your mind makes it hard or impossible for her to not allow herself then to be re-victimized. Because she's only accepted it at the verbal level. She can speak the language. Mm-hmm. She's learned the script in her therapy, but she hasn't internalized it. So she's still wounded. Right. You know, it's and, only scabbed over. It hasn't healed. Right. And that, for me, that is the, that's the essential piece. That's, so for me, that's the difference between what is called catharsis and cathexis. So you can have an emotional experience. I love experience. when you talk like that. I know. Uh, you can have this really intense emotional experience, but it doesn't lead you to true understanding. So catharsis right. is having that emotional experience. Cathexis is really understanding it. When somebody really accepts it and gets to a point of cathexis, they then can stop that process of being re-victimized. They can accept the critical parent or whatever in that situation without allowing themselves to be re-victimized by it. Well, that's one of the things we talked about in the last episode. We talked about the person that goes to the family reunion with the intention of announcing to everyone in the family, I was molested by Uncle John, and I want you all to turn to Uncle John and say, bad guy, Mm -hmm. and turn to me and say, good girl. Uh, That almost never happens in in a good way for anybody. And so... What I would talk to my clients about is if if you really feel that you need or want to go to the family reunion and Uncle John is going to be there, let's plan how you're going to handle that experience Mm -hmm. and come home without being re-victimized or re-wounded. How how are you going to do that if no one agrees with your perception of reality or no one validates you and, and Uncle John is, you know, leering at you and remembering that, you know, he abused you? And it, and if you can't do that, don't go. Mm-hmm. You know, if we if we can't come up with a strategy that you think you can hold on to, then I really would advise you not to go because you'll just get revictimized. Right. And I've actually had exactly that situation play out more than a few times in therapy. And for me, when you're talking about something that rises to the level of sexual abuse, mm-hmm. I, I think it's almost inevitably better for the person to not go and then learn how to deal with the guilt messages because there's always the guilt message. Yeah. Why are you Why not here? You come? Why yeah. are you separating the family? Who do you think you are? I think that's easier than... Well, and it's often, you know Uncle John didn't do that. Right. Or you know he's not responsible for that because he was drinking at the time, mm-hmm. You know, which diminishes and de- devalues you as a person if they say that to you. Or it was so far in the past, why yeah. can't why you can't just you get, get over, over it? it? Yeah, you've had sex before, you know, or of sense. And so those arguments just really play havoc with the mindset uh, and the emotions of the person who was victimized, but who still wants to have a role in the family. They want to be part of the family. They want to go for that event. My mother's getting older. Uncle John's her favorite brother. She doesn't believe he was ever capable of this, but she loves me and needs to see me for Christmas. How can I go and be there for my mom? Well, 
you have to decide that that's exactly what you're going to do. And it's not about you. It's right. your gift to your mother. And it doesn't even have to be to the level of trauma like sexual abuse, but just, you know, my father was cold and uncaring. My mother never showed me any kind of affection that made me feel special and feel loved. And now I'm going to go back into this situation. And as your client in the original example was saying, I've accepted that these are the limitations that my parents have. But every time I expose myself, I feel re-victimized. And you have to give yourself permission to not be re-victimized. Well, I, I use the analogy of just because they put the hook in the water, which you know they're going to do, doesn't mean you have to bite it. So let's talk about some strategies that you can use verbally or internally to turn away from the hook. Because if you bite the hook, it's going to hurt you. If you don't bite the hook, there's less chance that it will hurt you and that you can come home either minimally damaged or undamaged. And one of the things that I I struggle with, I'm not going to lie, uh, but I also find my clients have real difficulty with is this idea of, well, I'm the victim, so mm-hmm. I deserve to have some kind of special thing happen to acknowledge and make me whole. But what I say to people is, you know, victims don't need saviors. Victims need strength. You have to learn how to be able to save yourself. And that's really hard for people to do to wrap their heads around. Well, one of the issues in therapy with people that have a victim script is teaching them what the role, what the express reality of the script is and what the role that is that scripts play in their life and give them the empowerment to say, you can change the script, but it takes work. Mm -hmm. It takes effort. If you don't change the script, you'll always just recite your lines and the dance will continue. And that may be what happens. If you choose to go to the family reunion because Aunt Ethel is deathly ill and you want to be there and see her one last time, if you go and it becomes a really crappy thing for you and you come home, you can take it off like like showering off the mud that you got in the yard after the snow. You can come home and say, I'm not bringing that damaging experience back into my real life. But you also have the ability to choose the experience that you bring home. Yeah. If you're going for Aunt Ethel because Aunt Ethel is deathly ill and you're afraid that Aunt Ethel doesn't have enough another Christmas in her, right. then you are... You, you go can for that choose, reason. Stay focused right. on it. And that is what you remember. That is right. that is the focus of your experience. And then the rest of that stuff is vestigial. It's stuff that you don't have to pay attention to. But people get caught in the script. And everybody knows how to set the barb. And when you get in that situation and people do push your buttons, you respond in kind. That's what people have to learn how not to do. Or they have to learn how to say, Uncle John. I've asked you before, don't touch me. Mm-hmm. Even if Jesus is standing there, they don't have to make a big family crisis and let's all come and notice this, but you can just have good, healthy boundaries and you can learn how to have a boundary and say, mom, I'm not eating cake this Christmas because I'm on a diet and mom's going to guilt you or shame you and say, well, but Ethel made this cake for you and it may be the last Christmas cake mm-hmm. you'll ever have. You have to be able to say, you know, I appreciate all that, and I love Aunt Ethel, but I'm not going to eat the cake. And I really like the fact that you're bringing up this issue of boundaries because I think that's so essential. And that's how people learn mm-hmm. how to be able to not be a victim. I mean, once you can set a boundary and... In a healthy way, mm-hmm. not an aggressive way right. or a hostile way. Right. That's when you're not a victim yeah. anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and, and if this individual continues to want to push the buttons, want to continue to set the barb, but you can continue to reaffirm the boundary, now you are empowered. Absolutely. And, and you're not going to be re-victimized. You know, so, so let's review what we're talking about. We're talking about people that knowingly choose to go in harm's way. Maybe they've been in therapy, whatever, and they know these holiday events of my family are always damaging and hurtful to me. But for whatever reason, I'm going to choose to go to this event. So I have to set my expectations. I have to develop boundaries. I have to have my own script and I have to stay grounded so that I don't get swept away. But if I do get swept away, if they're better players than I am, 
then when I come home, I have to have a way to take it off and put it away mm -hmm. so that it doesn't continue to eat at me. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we try to teach people to do in therapy when they are deliberately going in harm's way to participate in a dysfunctional family event, whether it's Aunt Ethel's funeral or whether it's her last Christmas or it's just Thanksgiving. You know, we're, we're all going to be together for Thanksgiving. The roles, the scripts of the family dance are all established. Your role or script is to be this victim who gets re-victimized. That's how the family uses mm -hmm. you. You have a role. You can choose to go and participate and not follow the script, but you have to be prepared and to understand the reactions that everybody else is going to have. Because if you are going to change the script, mm -hmm. then you're making all of those other people emotionally uncomfortable absolutely and they're going to put pressure on you to try and return to that homeostatic oh, scripted yeah. they're going to call you back to the music you mm -hmm. know you're uh, it's like a syncopated rhythm you're out of tune let's get you back in tune so we're going to continue this series um if you have any questions for us you can always get us uh psychwithmike.com you can get old episodes you can get a hold of us through the contact button you can also uh, like the facebook page through there you and can follow me on twitter you'd like for us to speak to absolutely as always the theme music for psych with mike is written and produced and composed performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. We appreciate his efforts with Psych with Mike, and we will be back with another Psych with Mike next week. Mm -hmm.